All right, hey, we ready to get going here? It looks like we are We're live. Ready. Excellent. Okay, so um, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Rudy Zudima, and I'm the winemaker at Shady Brook Estate Winery. And I'm coming to you live uh, via our tasting patio. This is uh, the wonderful place uh, where people come and gather and get to taste our wines. There's a few groups out here enjoying wine today. Um, and we are open for business. So uh, next time you are in Napa Valley, please come visit us. Um, I have the fantastic pleasure of being joined or co-hosted with uh, Miss Lynn Stray, uh, one of the owners and marketing director of the Farmstead Cheese Company located in uh, the, on the beautiful Marin Coast. Uh, and we are going to, uh, she's going to make me look great today by helping my wines taste even better paired with her delicious, delicious cheeses from their um, incredible organic uh, farm. So Lynn, thank you very, very much for uh, coming on board today. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited to be here. Um, so uh, Shady Brook Estate has been around for uh, just uh, four short years. Um, we make a variety of different wines, a couple of whites, a couple of a few reds. Um, we're going to taste three of our wines today, uh, two from our Wrap Ranch brand and one from our Shady Brook Estate brand. Um, and then we're going to pair those with, again, three fantastic cheeses from the Farmstead Cheese Company. So. Hey, Lynn, why don't you do us a favor, tell us a little bit about Farmstead, and um, I'd love to hear about it again myself. Yeah, sure. Um, and thanks, Rudy. So those of you who don't know, uh, we go pretty far back, Rudy. Um, you're really good friends with um, another winemaker friend of ours. And um, Rudy, we've been following Rudy for many years and his great winemaking. And so it's really exciting to have our cheese and Shady Brook paired and Wrap Ranch paired today. Um, a lot of similarities when we talk about cheese and wine, um, and it really all starts with the soil. So Point Reyes Farmstead is my family's farm, and uh, my parents, I'm third generational dairy family out in West Marin, and my parents purchased um, our farm in 1959. And the dairy was for the first 40 years, my parents uh, had a fluid milk dairy, which meant that they just sold the milk. The milk truck would come every day, pick up the milk, and leave. And so therefore, my father was uh, very, I think, frustrated over the years that he didn't actually have a finished product that he could share with his friends, similar to winemaker friends of his. So 40 years later, uh, my sisters and I, I have three other sisters, we went into business with my parents and converted a fluid milk dairy into a dairy plus a creamery. Farmstead means that we use only our own source of milk on the property with the cheese that's made on the property. So it's really about that soil, it's about the climate, it's all about the terroir that brings the flavors of the land into um, the milk through a healthy animal and then into the cheese fat into some great cheese. So very similar to an estate grown vineyard. So we compare that quite often. Um, and really what it is, it's the sense of uh, full quality control around everything that's happening um, on that property. So it's like a full sustainable loop of the process and the people and the animals all working together. We have a, it's just a cow dairy. Um, it's all natural. And we're going to be tasting some cheese here, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But we've been making cheese since 2000. So we started putting our milk in the vat in 2000. And as um, some of you may know, if you're familiar with Point Reyes Farmstead, that original blue is our flagship. So that's what most of us for, is blue cheese. And that's right. actually all we made for the first nine years was our original blue. But we're going to taste some um, other cheeses today, our Toma line. So you'll get a, a wide variety um, and breadth of what our, our milk does and what our cheesemakers are doing with the milk. Um, today, we also, not only are we making cheese, but we have a culinary uh, facility on center on the farm where we teach classes, cheese making classes, a lot of cooking classes. So it's all about education and entertainment. And I have to tell you, with COVID, um, we really miss having everybody out to the farm and we can't wait to open up again. 
But in the meantime, hopefully the Zoom um, educational series that we have on our website will bring you closer to the farm and you'll be able to take tours and such via our Zoom, educa Zoom educational series on our web. So yeah, that's about, oh, well, that's you've been here before cool. Rudy, so that's you know the, all about the cows and, and and it is so cool and um, it is so, um, it's, I love how, how full um, circle the entire ranch is. Just, you know, starting with your little nurseries and the types of cows that you have and how you nurture them along the way and they get trained to be happy cows making really delicious milk and, and subsequently awesome cheese. And, and I remember Teddy told me for a little while that you guys were growing different kinds of, um, different kind, hey Teddy, uh, you guys were growing different <laughs> of, um, of crops out in the field for your cows to eat different crops and you would get different acids and different cream um, percentages and so forth. And I just thought the whole, um, the whole program was so, so unique and, and so much more in depth than I thought. And it was great learning about it. Yeah, we have a whole nutritional program for our animals. And we have the Holsteins, um, our primary um, breed that we have. So they're the black and white cows, and they are really raised for dairy and high production. So they graze off of the property. And another benefit of being farmstead is we have a closed herd. So as you mentioned, we have our baby cows, and we raise all of our own cows on the farm. We do our breeding there. So essentially, it's all our own leather stock. We're not purchasing cows from an outside source and raising them. Um, that gives us consistency in our genetics and our breeding. And then as far as nutrition goes, that's really important um, because it's really about what the cow is eating to maximize their energy as well as to create really high quality components. And when we talk about components in milk, we're talking about protein, fat, solids, non-fat, and all of that in its right balance will give us great milk for uh, making cheese. So it's something that we look at very closely. As a matter of fact, we have a nutritionist that comes once a month and is one of our consultants. He's been with us for probably 30, 35 years. So he's kind of part of our team and he helps with um, creating that perfect diet for the cows and um, buying of the feed. And as you mentioned, we have, we're on about 700 acres and about 150, 170 acres, we grow a ryegrass and we, the cows graze off of that for a portion of the year when they can. And then when they can't, in the late spring, we are cutting it and we're preserving it into a silage, which is just a way to preserve oh, yeah. the grass. And then we feed that to them in the dry months. So we're coming up upon that right now, as most people know in California, our hills, our hills are golden brown and it gets very dry. So that's, we don't have that really green um, grass that has a lot of nutrition in it. So by preserving the spring and the winter grass, we're able to give them a consistent diet along with some other food components, just to right. um, make sure that they have a really healthy, healthy plate of food every day. Wow, it, is, it truly is really remarkable how parallel these two industries are, how we are nurturing our plants and our soil in our own way and and our, our word estate is your farmstead and how um, uh, being really encapsulated and kind of in, in control of everything that we do is the yes. really the true way to, to achieve quality. So this is really cool. Yeah, a lot of synergies between um, vineyards and, and farms. And when we get into actually creating these great products through the fermentation process, and the aging process, which most of our cheeses are aged, um, it, it is a really great complement. And I'm excited for these pairings because they'll just elevate each of the each of the items here and uh, give hopefully everybody a new experience. Indeed. All right. Well, with that, let's get into our first little tasting here. Uh, sure. We have a couple of friends of ours are online today. Um, Lynn, uh, Michael Kelly. Hello, Michael Kelly. Thanks for joining us. Linda Boney is here. She says to say hello. So thanks for joining us. Um, so anyway, yes, we're going to start with our uh, Shady Brook Estate uh, white wine. Um, it is called the Platine Blanc, and it is a semi Um This wine comes from our uh, Pope Valley Estate. It is 81% Semillon, and the rest is our Sauvignon Blanc. It comes from the same vineyard. Um, so this vineyard is located in one of the warmer regions of Napa Valley, 
which is very, very conducive to get these uh, grapes, Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon, good and ripe and a little bit kind of earlier on in the season so that they retain a lot of their really beautiful crisp acids. Um, this wine is kind of a, uh, a take on what a real white Bordeaux would be, um, using those same varieties, but also now then aged for a little bit while, a little while in um, French oak barrels. Um, so while French oak barrels can often uh, offer some beautiful flavors and kind of help enhance a wine, um, my take on these two varieties is that they are so pretty and so delicate and so lovely all by themselves, I really don't want winemaking to get too much in the way. So I use some barrels that we have had now for eight, nine, ten years. So we still get the effects of, of aging and changing and, and, and really evolving in the barrel while they're in that breathable vessel. But all of the flavors that those, uh, those toasted oak staves um, once had have been long leached out. So again, we get these very, very pure, pure, um, un, uh, uh, enhanced, un non-manipulated flavors of Semillon and Sauvignon Blanc. Um, some really nice apricot, some nice peach flavors. Um, uh, the texture to me is, is absolutely gorgeous. And um, definitely one of the reasons why we wanted to, uh, to pair it with this fantastic Toma cheese. Um, that, that Toma cheese has such a beautiful, creamy, tangy uh, flavor to it and texture to it. I think it's just a, a match made in heaven. Mm. How, so Lynn, Rudy, how long will this wine um, last? Um, What's like the age profile? I mean, it's excellent right now, but if I was to buy a ton of it. I mean, how would it taste in a year from now or two years from now? Well, yeah, typically California whites are consumed, you know, within the first three or four years uh, from the production date. We're drinking the 2017 today. Um, but uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I had one of our 2012s that was absolutely sensational. Even a little bit more creamy, even a little bit more viscosity in the mouth certainly still had some, some delicious, youthful, uh, tangy acids and, and plenty of life left in it. But uh, there's no reason why this couldn't be, uh, you know, an eight, 10 year white wine, which is unusual for California. Yeah, but you're I right, this, you can get in. Yeah, I love this wine. It's, um, we were talking about it earlier and I was starting to take a couple of sips, but it, uh, it's, it's got just this, this it's got, this elegance and balance to it, so well-rounded in your mouth, and it's got this nice little slight kind of honey note um, that goes really well with the Toma. As a matter of fact, we've, we've uh, sampled like an orange blossom honey to go with Toma, mm. and I get some of those notes coming out of it with some nice fruit, but, um, and, and what I like about it too is the acidity at the end because it's just, it, well, it balances out that kind of elegance in the front end, so. Yes, really I think you have to have that acid to keep the wine nice and juicy in your mouth. It brings that refreshing quality to the wine. And it also makes it, you know, friendly in so many situations with something so mm -hmm. pure and clean and simple as this cheese that makes it actually pop, you know, so would uh, a grilled scallop or, you know, some other light cell shellfish. I mean, it really needs that acid to, to do. Um, yeah, I hope everybody's nibbling right now. I'm sure they are because they're hungry for an afternoon snack. <laughs> <laughs> what could be better? Um, yeah, um, our Toma is, I think you, you just said something that I really like is that this wine is really friendly. And we use that term a lot with Toma too. And it actually has a tagline, anytime, any table. And that was kind of our, our intent when we made Toma was something that can be used from morning till night. Right. And just be versatile, but also just as a snacking can go with a lot of different um, accompaniments and, and flavors. So that's great. This is, this is a great combination. I was just imagining melting some of this Toma cheese on some awesome like rye bread or something that has a little bit more of an earthy tone to it with the, with the fruitiness and liveliness of that. This cheese would just be an incredible little snack cracker. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, this is, this is great. One of the things when we taste cheese and we have a, cup, a few different wine um, choices in front of us is, I know that this is our pick that we picked out a couple of weeks ago, right. but everybody's got different preferences and to kind of go back and forth and, and play with the different wines with the cheeses so that you can find your favorite um, because there is kind of no wrong answer we always say, but I do think that this is a super, it's a complimentary um, pairing too. So, it has, this has been a, a fantastic part of our cheese board. Um, most of our tastings that we do here at Shady Brook Estate are accompanied by a little cheese and charcuterie pairing. And we've got a number of your cheeses on in the past, but this has absolutely been a huge favorite. And we always look forward to springtime when we do bring the Platine Blanc out. Um, we celebrate the Platine Blanc and we have it along with your Toma and it is absolutely fun. Great. Um, I want to talk about Toma and tell you how we make it, but first, can I just say now that I'm um, tasting this, what I'm tasting right now is that with the cheese and the wine, I am getting a lot of toasted notes coming out of the combination of the two. So Toma is, um, Toma in Italian means uh, wheel of cheese made by the farmer, him or herself. So it really defines what farmstead is, that it's a it's a cheese, it's like a table cheese, a farmer's cheese. It's a cheese maker or a farmer's really, um, it's the, it, what represents their milk flavors. And it's meant to be something that literally in, it, in Italy is, you have it on the table in the morning, you sit on it, you cook with it as the day goes on, you go back and snack on it with a little charcuterie, and then you can cook with it. It's a great melting cheese, but it really represents that everyday part of your everyday diet, that friendly cheese. Um, having said that, we have a cheese maker. Our cheese maker is from Poland. And when he first came over to the United States um, about, gosh, probably about 12 years ago, he's been with us for 11. So wait, he came over 13 years ago, but he's been with us for 11 years. But when he first came over, he learned from a Dutch cheese maker. And so a lot of his influences with some of our cheeses is through the Dutch process. And I know in a future tasting that we have, I think it's the next one in, um, in July, July 2nd, we're going to be tasting our Gouda, a traditional Gouda that oh, he nice. has created for Point Reyes Farmstead. But he also created this one in the same kind of process, make process as um, Dutch cheeses. And so what that means is that we use the whole milk when it goes into the vat for Toma, and we're using a combination of cultures. So the combination of cultures is really the cheesemaker's secret recipe. It's their cocktail of cultures that creates the different flavor um, characteristics that we're trying to drive through the flavor of the milk. And so he has a combination of different Dutch cultures. So it's not a traditional Gouda flavor. Um, some people have that, like that uh, direction of like a Havarti, but it's a neither. It's a combination that makes it very unique. But we really wanted to drive through that butteriness of that milk flavor up front. Uh, and so the process then, after we add our cultures into the milk, and before we actually separate the curds in the whey, and then the curds go into the um, our forms to create the cheese, before that, we actually wash the curd um, with some um, warm water, hot water. And people have heard of uh, washed brine cheeses. This is very different. This is a washed curd, which is, as I mentioned, um, part of a Dutch style cheese. And so you wash the curds. Um, and what that does is it actually brings some of that, um, that, that peach level down. And then it creates this kind of nutty flavor, the sweetness that comes with a Dutch style cheese. So we've captured a lot of that in the Toma. And then once we actually drain out the whey, we put the curds in the form, and then we press the cheese. And when we press the cheese, we're trying to um, get rid of, that was a door, uh, we're trying to get rid of the, um, some of that whey and really compress the, the curds so that we don't have any um, eyes or air pockets. So we want to make that dense, and you'll see that with the cheese here. 
Um, and then from there, it goes into a brine tank, a salt brine, um, for a couple days. And then we put it on a shelf for about three months, and we're constantly turning it and create very thin rind on the outside. And as you can see with this cheese, we actually have a very thin um, cheese coating on the outside. We don't do as much as like you would see in a, a traditional Gouda where it's more waxed. This is a very thin kind of layer that you can just peel off or not eat, or but it's also food grade. So um, that, that is our Toma. And like I said, the flavors that we're trying to get through, it's very buttery up front. Um, and with this wine, you get the, almost like a, like a brown butter, which I think is really interesting. It changes it. And then at the end, you have this um, acidity. And we always say it's kind of like, um, like a grassy tang, similar to what the cows are eating out on our fields. And then it balances out that fat in the front. But once again, super friendly. And um, it, it just goes with so many things. And I think this wine is just a great example of that. It is indeed very, very friendly. I can't stop putting it in my mouth. But so. Um, you know, since I, I love hearing this all about Toma, we're going to stick with Toma for another, for our next um, tasting, but we're going to move on to your, uh, your flavored Toma, um, which I think is Toma kind of ramped up a little bit. And I think that's a great way to describe our Wrap Ranch Chardonnay, which is the next wine we're going to taste here. So while um, the Platinet Blanc is, again, very, very simple and straightforward we try and keep it very very pure um, with Chardonnay people tend to like a little bit more complexity and to have a little bit more of, of what Chardonnay has has kind of grown and become here in the United States um, which is a little bit more uh, of a heavier weight and a little bit heavier texture um, a little bit more influence from oak barrels and just a, a, a bigger white wine in general so um, this wine is also a very small production for us, just uh, 250 cases or so, so uh, very, very small. We sell just about all of it right here on the patio. Um, but uh, the vineyard sources for this um, are two different vineyards from the Carneros region. Um, the Carneros region is very, very close to the San Pablo Bay, um, so it gets lots of fog in the, uh, after, in the evenings and uh, that lingers into the mornings. Um, it gets some really nice cool ocean breezes in the afternoon. In general, it's just kind of a, a cooler climate area for uh, the Napa Valley. Um, it's a little bit too cool to really ripen Cabernet, Cabernet Franc. Um, and it is uh, meant for those kind of more delicate thin skin varieties. Chardonnay and Pinot Noir are beautiful uh, from, from Carneros. So these two sites that we have um, have very different uh, purposes um, when they come together in this wine. Um, one of the sites is on a little bit heavier soil, a little bit more clay. Um, the wine comes out a little bit more one-dimensional, but with this incredibly firm and beautiful stream of, of fruit acid, kind of real green apple, kind of fig, and almost citrus notes, but just, just electric kind of acid. Um, the other site is in very well-drained soils. Um, it struggles a little bit more for ripeness. It doesn't produce nearly as much fruit, but we get the really pretty and the charming and the, the kind of complex notes that Chardonnay can bring out. Um, almost like apple cobbler and little notes of cinnamon and clove and allspice, uh, a buttery, cakey, almost, almost dough kind of quality. Um, but it can sometimes be a little bit flabby. So in comes the other Chardonnay from the other vineyard source with all of that acid and that intensity. And we just sort of lift up those really fun flavors from that second site. Mm -hmm. So um, from there, the wine is blended and then does go into 70% uh, brand new French oak barrels. It is aged in those French oak barrels for uh, almost two years where the texture really is starting to form the viscosity is coming out and now we've got a really nice big pretty chardonnay with with a flavor profile that goes all the way from one end to the other and i can't wait to see how it is going to uh to pair with your beautiful beautiful truffle toma she's off the screen <laughs> 
We lost her for a minute, but she's back. There's Lynn. Are we back? Lynn, you're back. Excellent. So um, I was just finishing up with everybody about the Chardonnay and uh, its sort of complexity and everything that's okay. going on. Yeah. Um, and I'm just now getting into trying some of your uh, your uh, truffle toma. So um, we heard a little bit about how you make your toma. I'm and a truffle. You with it, but how does the truffle come into that? How do you incorporate that? But the ironic thing is I didn't know the truffle meant. Yeah, so first, uh, well, first I want to compliment you. This is a fantastic Chardonnay. And as I was saying that the toastedness of the Semillon regular toma brought out like a, like a brown. This one, um, when I first smell our toma, I get that yeasty sourdough kind of um, aroma and a little bit of that flavor coming through, but it's really in that, that smell. And um, with this wine, I get some um, kind of oatiness. So it's like oatmeal or something like that, or graham crackers, which it kind of complements our butteriness of the toma. So um, I, it just is a beautiful Chardonnay. And the combination, when you talk about uh, location, I just wanted to mention, I don't think I mentioned where Point Reyes is located, but we're an hour north of San Francisco, right on the coast. So we have that really cool climate year round, except for today. I think it's, which is really hot for points. So we're kind of babies, we're fog babies out here. So when it gets about 80, it feels like 100. <laughs> what wow. that means to our cows, though, is we only have a few here that are like that. They love the fog. And typically we're sitting, you know, 15 degrees year round, which is exactly what cows like. <laughs> Our climate's really my but we're we're kind of purists with cheese, as I'm sure you are with your wine too. We really want the flavors of the milk to come through and the artistic style of the cheese maker and the cultures that we select to really uh, now a particular style, whether it's texture and flavor of our cheeses. And we were out a few years ago to make a flavored cheese. And we kind of balked it and said, no. And let me go grab the piece five. Cheese. Flavored cheeses are for people who make mediogies that just want to kind of mask it. Well, we got asked so often that we finally uh, decided, okay, everybody wanted me to um, go ahead the technical difference. Oh, I'm sideways. Rudy, how did I get sideways? Am I back? There we go. Am I drinking too much of your wine, Rudy? Okay, cool. Let me know. I was lying down on my side, so it looked normal to me. <laughs> that's that's probably not the first time. <laughs> so, so when we started searching out different herbs and spices um, for to complement the toma, uh, which toma, by the way, because it's so buttery, it well to, this, we knew we had to create this like perfect balance, and then whatever um, you have in the spicy herbs, so that it really just flowed through nicely and had a nice long finish. Um, one of the ones that we knew we wanted to do right away was truffle. And the reason is because we all love truffle, but we've had the pleasure and um, to be able to go to Italy. And about six years ago, we were in Umbria. Our family went for a family vacation and we stayed in a home in Umbria, um, which is known for its wine as well and um, truffles. So we met the Sabatino family and they are truffle producers and they have their own farm where they have truffles and then they work with other farmers around Italy and um, to create their, uh, their truffle products. And they sell here in the U.S. as well. And anyway, when we went, uh, we had a foodie friend that connected us. We were able to go truffle hunting with these cute little dogs and got to see the, the real authentic truffle hunting. And when you taste real truffles from Italy, it's not like getting truffle fries at 
AT&T Park in San Francisco. It is, you know, really earthy, subtle, sweet, elegant. It just like, it's perfumey, but yet it's, once again, it can be really subtle. And it's a lovely, lovely um, smell. So if you just smell the cheese right away, it's not overpowering. Um, what uh, Sabatier has done is they worked with us to make a truffle pate, which we put into um, the curds after we draw down some of our whey. And we'll put it in with the curds in the whey right before we put it into the press table. And uh, the, the pate is made in like a tapenade when it comes in a jar. So it's got some natural oils from it, but it's got bits and pieces and zest from it, but it's actually the truffle. Um, and it's not a manufactured oil. And as you taste it, you, if you like truffle, and if you don't think you like truffle, tr because this is not your typical, what you find in a lot of, like I said, restaurants in California that serve truffle fries. Yeah, um, yeah. This yeah, to me is subtle. just really nice. What do you think, Bree? You know, it's it's so, you, you nail it on the right on the head. It's, it's such a, a, a complex cheese but it really is the cheese that comes first before that truffle. I love that little bit of earthiness that's kind of on the, the back, back end of, of tasting the cheese. But just like the, the original Toma, the first one, that really nice acid, that creamy buttery quality is absolutely there. And it's only at the very end when you get that little hint of truffle. It is, a, it is beautifully, beautifully balanced. Um, and that earthiness to me is what kind of right when the Chardonnay, um, after those kind of sweeter, richer notes start to fade away and you just, you kind of are finishing up with the, with the pear-ish kind of acid, that mingled with that earthy quality from the cheese is dazzling. Really, really a, a great pairing. Yeah, and you know what's interesting about truffles is, you know, people always think it's like, oh, it's, it's a, a mushroom flavor. Well, what you're tasting with a, a really good truffle like this is there's a little bit of sweetness to it. And that re reminds me of like a like a dried strawberry, but then you have the earthiness that comes from that mushroomy kind of what we're associating with. And so it's this combination that's just super pleasant. Um, I think it pairs really nicely. Like you have to have a little bit more body that the Chardonnay brings compared to the Semillon mm. to stand up to that truffle as well. So I think this is a great pairing. Most definitely. I'm very excited. We'll have to... Uh... Definitely, this will be probably later on in the fall will we um, have this on our cheese board. So, Lynn, do you make these um, cheese year round or is there a certain season that you make the Tomas or are you always kind of producing um, all of the products? We are making them year round. People associate truffle cheeses with the holidays, but no, we are making them year round. So don't be shy if you like truffle and you want to eat it in um, February, June right. or whenever. Yeah, no, we, it's, it's a year round product that we make. Um, I love, I don't know about you, but I love breakfast for dinner. And this, uh, Tomas are so great. I'd love to grate it into my um, scrambled eggs. And I love the Toma grated into scrambled eggs and with um, like just a, a dash of a really good balsamic on top. And this wine would be a fabulous dinner and so easy. Great, great dinner indeed. Hmm. Um, all right, well, I think uh, we should move on to our, our third wine. Um, I am definitely saving some of the That's Chardonnay so and some of the Platine Blanc and some of those cheeses to go back and revisit with. Um, but this next pairing, I'm really, really excited to try. Uh, we did it when uh, we sort of had a, a pre-meeting and it is a showstopper. Um, so we are pairing um, the Farmstead uh, Original Blue Cheese with our Pinot Noir. So our Pinot Noir is also 2017. Um, it is also from the Carneros region of Napa Valley. And um, this was the very first time uh, with Rap Ranch that I had ever made any Pinot Noir. Um, and so when we first um, sort of were working on whether it was going to have a place in our lineup or not, we, um, we did a little research. We went out to, to taste a whole bunch of different Pinot Noirs to see kind of what our style would be. And I was leaning towards this 
really big, aggressive, kind of a, a, a wine lover's wine, uh, almost a cab lover's wine with bigger tannins and bigger extraction, darker colors, lots of oak, just a really, really big, big Pinot Noir. And um, as we did our research and we went and tried Oregonian wines, Mendocino, Central Coast, uh, and plenty here in Napa and Sonoma, um, I quickly found that the more exciting wines, the more exciting Pinot Noirs were the much more soft and kind of subtle, not in your face, but with really underlying power that was so much more intense, but in such a soft sort of velvet glove style. So um, we went to a couple of vineyard sites. We found one that we loved. And so now our Pinot Noir, in my opinion, again, is a very sort of delicate style wine where all of the nuances, all of the subtleties can really, really be seen. They're very intricate layers. They're very, very fine, subtle flavors, but they really all come through. And um, it really is about this, the acid again, that is holding this wine together. Um, this is also the only wine that comes out of the Shady Brook Estate and Wrap Ranch cellar that does not see any brand new French oak. I think, again, those flavors are so delicate and so pretty that too much new oak is going to just kind of overwhelm them rather than, than really integrate. So all of the, uh, the oak aging, all of the time that this wine has had to develop and, and evolve has all happened in two, three, and four-year-old barrels where maybe a hint of nuttiness might be found, but otherwise a very, very straightforward and a very pure Pinot Noir. Um, we made a very small amount of this also, just 270 cases. And um, I cannot wait to get some of your original blue cheese in my mouth to go along with this, with this wine. Yeah. Um, it's a beautiful color too. It's like this underlying kind of brown note, kind of chocolatey note underneath the red hue. It's really pretty. Um, and love, it's got, it also has like this like a background note of tobacco, but it's not, it's really subtle. So it gives it the complexity that you're talking about and that richness, that earthiness that I like in a Pinot. Um, and that kind of cherry, a little bit of figgy, but you balance, I don't, how do you balance out all those fruit flavors? Um, you know, for us, it's really about bringing out the best that the vineyard has to offer. Um, I would hate to say, and I would never really choose to do it, to, to be a recipe winemaker, where you want to make a Pinot that absolutely has brown sugar, and it absolutely has black cherry, and it has, uh, you know, um, gosh, any bevy of flavors, and you sort of craft it to, to make that those flavors. Um, mm -hmm. To me, those are unnatural wines. So it really is being the best steward of your land, growing your grapes with proper nutrition, Proper, uh, proper balance of, of crop load every year, um, of sun exposure, um, irrigation, managing all of those and making sure that the, the grapes are going to have the most opulent flavors they can possibly have. And then you sort of get to kick back and relax and let the wine really uh, show itself off. Um, you know, it's like, it's like having a child and trying to make sure that they play golf or that they know how to roller skate. You know, if they don't like those things, they don't. You let the child grow up to be what it is and you help it along um, yeah. with the choices that it makes by itself. Um, yeah. So I, I think with Pinot Noir, that shows off more than anything. It really is such a finicky yeah. grape that if you try and push or pull in a certain way, it will really just bite you and, uh, and, and turn away from you. So it really is just embracing these, these natural flavors that come in from, from the vineyard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I love about Pinots is that there's lots of different um, flavor profiles of Pinots. And um, when we talk about blue cheese, you think of having it with a cab or something that's got some tannins or something bold enough to stand up to mold a, a piquant flavor, a peppery note. Um, but this actually does a great job because, and you wouldn't normally think of a Pinot standing up to um, a peppery strong blue, but I think because it has that, as you were saying, that black cherry, I, you know, like I said, that little underlying smokiness, that tobacco, but, um, but it doesn't 
it's just got this really great mouthfeel and balance that, um, let's try it with the glue because I think it's going to stand up just fine. It absolutely does. So they really, the, they really complement each other. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to chase it first before I talk about the glue. So, and then I also want to hear, I know that you guys, uh, when you first started to turn into from a dairy to a creamery, it was all about blue. And, and again, this is the original blue. Um, but I'm really, I, I'd love to hear the story about how you guys decided to come out of the gate so well and so strong with just blue cheese. Um, and as much as we appreciate the diversity and some of these other uh, che uh, flake cheeses that have some flavors and other nuances, um, this blue cheese is just world class, and and obviously you've honed in pretty well on on how to do it perfectly. But I just would love to hear how that all started. Yeah, so um, really, it started in probably nineteen ninety seven, and my father was, as I was mentioning earlier, he hated to see the milk truck drive away and not have a cheese, that, a product, a finished product that he could share with his friends, because he loves to. Um, be with his friends and have people over at the table and anyway he um started talking about what well, what's the next generation what's the next life of our dairy how are we going to continue it on are we going to continue it on and in the late 90s conventional dairying was not doing very well and the price of milk is controlled or was controlled by the state and federal government it's controlled by the federal government now. Um, but it was it was going up and down the price of milk. And our inputs were continuing to climb, like most businesses. But the price of, the price of milk was actually at um, another kind of low during the late 90s. And so it was becoming harder and harder to be uh, to operate a dairy, a fluid milk dairy, unless you were selling your milk to a cheesemaker or you were actually producing a, a value-added product off the farm. So we got to a point where my father said, we gotta talk about the business. And my sisters and I were not involved at that moment. And when we started talking about it, we said, well, we're not really interested in the animal side of the business. We had moved away, had our careers and our families, but we had a common passion and interest towards cooking and cheese and food. And so when he said, hey, what do you think about cheese making? we really jumped at that chance. And when we started talking about what is our first cheese gonna be? Not to mention we had absolutely zero experience in cheese making and food science. So it was really um, a new journey for us. And we learned through some different educational, higher educational um, experiences, how to make cheese and um, how to run a creamery and the equipment side of it and the animal side of it. So we've been through 20 years now of, of really evolving through that. But in the beginning, honestly, we kind of just sat around the table and said, what do we love? And we all loved blue cheese, which you would think is kind of odd because we didn't grow up in Europe. We didn't grow up in you know England with still. We didn't grow up in Italy with Gorgonzola or France with Roquefort. But we all love blue cheese. And when we really looked around, we realized that there wasn't a lot of high-end domestic blue cheese being made in the United States. At that time, it was really only Maytag um, that was distributed nationally and that was really well known. Um, and then when we started looking locally, even just in the state of California, when I talk about local, nobody was making blue cheese. So we thought, okay, this is a great opportunity to kind of carve our path in this niche and really uh, make something with high grade A milk and hands-on artisanal care and make a really good blue cheese. So we forged into this, honestly, without even knowing what the process was. And then once we learned, we realized why nobody was making blue cheese. It's a really hands-on cheese. It's a lot of labor and it's a difficult cheese to make because you have this um, blue mold that first of all can be very contagious if you don't control it in your aging room and um, can just also be kind of finicky and trying to get that right pH with that. Um, so it was an interesting um, cheese to learn to make and why we chose one of the hardest cheeses to make at the beginning is probably because we didn't know any better. But it served us really well. And for nine years, that's all we made was this cheese. 
Um, it's also our only raw milk cheese that we have in our selection today. And uh, we started out as a raw milk cheese because we can age it. We aged it about six months when we first started making it the first couple of years. And then we were, as time went on, we learned how to bring that aging down. We released this about three to four months now, closer to three and a half. And, um, but when you have an asset that's sitting there for a long time, that's another reason why a lot of people, similar to wine, it's like, okay, those that get into the wine business, you're putting a lot of, uh, you know, your, your risk and your assets up on that shelf for a few years. Yep, so, um, it's what well, like I said, it served us well. Uh, we were really excited to make this cheese and it, I think it's gotten better over the years and our cheese makers do a phenomenal job. It's very unique as far as other blues in the United States because of its mouth feel. And I'll talk about that when I talk about the make process. But um, there's not still a lot of raw milk blues out there. Um, as you probably know, just in the wine industry, the food safety guidelines today with FDA are becoming a lot more stringent and having a raw product compared to a pasteurized product. Um, there's just a lot of other steps that you have to go to through, but we feel that this cheese absolutely has a distinct flavor because of its raw milk um, process. It really gives you this two dimensional um, flavor and um, outcome. And we're not, we're gonna taste Bay Blue, which is another blue that we make um, that's phenomenal in its own right. Um, but it has multiple layers of flavors into its finish. This one is really like sweet, bright milk flavors up front, and then you have that pepper pungency at the end. So it's those microbes that are just like, just like charging forward and give you that true like blue flavor. Um, yeah, it's re really, really focused with those flavors. I know that, you know, sometimes um, I think what threw at least like my children off and so forth was that there was this, this awkward ammonia kind of flavor that went along and, and really rubbed them wrong. Um, and it was crumbly and it was a little bit dry, but this is, has just such a silky texture to it and such a pure, um, yeah, again, uh, peppery kind of flavor to it. Um, so I wanted to also mention real quickly that um, uh, your nephew and Taisa are on with us. So hello to them, Taisa Vera. Uh, hi guys. <laughs> they have been out here to the winery. I think you guys might have sat right here at this table. Yes. So thanks yeah, for letting us yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that's yeah. great. Um, glad you guys could join us. We love having all of our family. Um, they're our best uh, grassroots marketing, so keep, keep watching. Um, so yeah, the Bay Blue, I mean, I'm sorry, the original Blue, and I'm confusing you because Bay, we're going to have in another tasting session. We just have the original here, which is our one raw milk. This one is, um, so Give you a quick um, education uh, 101 on original blue. So whole milk again, all of our cheese, we put all the milk in the vat. So we don't standardize it. We don't add cream. We don't try to manipulate our milk components. We put it all in the vat. It's and not then homogenous. what makes this so unique is from the very beginning, we separate our skim and our butter fat. And then we homogenize just our butter fat. And what that does is it breaks up those fat globules so that when it opens up, the enzymes, when we're adding our cultures and our rennet, it's all attacking it a lot faster so that it becomes creamy in the aging process. That's kind of the end result is you get this really luxurious, creamy, almost butter-like flavor in your mouth, um, texture, I'm sorry, in your mouth. Um, and I think you mentioned, you know, other blues can sometimes be very dry or, dry or crumbly. This is something that is it's known for its full kind of fat flavor in your mouth. Um, it's really luxurious. It's got that kind of sweet, bright lactic flavor up front of the milk, and then it goes straight into that pepper pungency that has a nice long finish. So we call this kind of the workhorse in the kitchen for chefs because so many chefs have uh, used this on their menus, everything from, of course, salads, 
to uh, on um, steaks and on burgers. Um, I love it. Our chef um, in house at the Fork, she even makes a blue cheese ice cream with it, a really subtle wow. amounts of it, so that it gives it a nice little tang and a little blue cheese note with some balsamic strawberries. So there's a lot of different creative ways that you can use um, our blue. In Italy, if, if some people are a little shy with blue cheeses because it can be a little, you know, oh, I don't know if I like blue cheese. It's so strong and aromatic. Uh, drizzle a little honey on it. It's very traditional in Italy to drizzle honey on your blue cheese. So it's that sweetness that's going with that saltiness of that pepperness, uh, pepperiness with the cheese. But let's get back to the wine with this because this is... Um, a great combination and what we often a lot of what goes well with the original blue are your your figs your cherries your you know your cranberries your um kind of those darker fruits that um cranberries you think about in a, in a uh a salad or something i love um kind of that dried fig note to it too but even just a a cherry here, and it'll be interesting to try it with the Chardonnay and the Semillon as well, because whites actually complement the um, the original blue as well. So let me know what you think. Yeah, I have been, um, uh, while I'm getting so um, uh, delightfully educated from you, I've been kind of bouncing back and forth a little bit with the different cheeses and wine and finding this really cool sense of balance between them all. I think the pairings that we have set up are probably the, the best, but there was beautiful combinations that went on between the truffle and the and the uh, Pinot Noir um, and the Chardonnay with the with the original Toma. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I always think in restaurants if the food dishes are all balanced, you should be able to drink any kind of wine with them. And if the cheeses are balanced like this, you should be able to drink any any wine with them, so long as the wine balance too. Um, but this has been a really really awesome tasting. What a, uh, a delight of flavors that we have had. Um, so, um, Lynn, I know okay. um, we, we're going to add, we're going to put some links up where everybody can find your cheeses and uh, they can find our wine, certainly. And we hope that you go visit the fork um, out at, at Point Reyes Blue Cheese. Um, they have an incredible hospitality center out there. And it is one of the happiest places a cow could ever be. And it's one of the happiest places any uh, food foodie would ever want to go to as well. Um, we Thank certainly you. would love to have every all of you here at Shady Brook Estate. Um, hope that you had the cheeses and wines together today. But if you were just paying uh, paying attention and didn't quite have them, you've got to get on board for the next session. Uh, uh, we have three more cheeses and three more wines to go through two more times. That's six more cheeses, six wines. Um, the next one is going to be on July 2nd at 4 p.m. Um, I will be right here in Thaisa's cabana, cabana number two at Shady Brook Estate. Um, and um, so, uh, Lynn, thank you very, very much for, uh, for doing this together with us. It was an absolute delight, and I can't wait to get back out to the farm. And uh, hopefully you guys will get a chance to come back this way, maybe even next week, I hear. So we'll see. Yes, we're taking a group. There'll be seven of us. So watch out. We might have to do it after you've done your work for the day. We'll sit down. How's that sound? <laughs> All right. I'll make sure that I am clocked out for uh, when you guys get here. Good. Okay. All right. We'll give right. our best. Thank to you so much, fun. Rudy. This was a pleasure. Can't wait till the next one. It was so much fun. Say hi to Teddy and all the gang out there. And we will see will you do. very, very soon. Thank you. All right. Go long. Thanks, Thanks. everybody.